Good morning, Good Shepherd. We get ready to start our devotion, <clears throat> and our scripture is going to come from Psalms one, one through four. Psalms one, one through four. Amen. Test. There we go. We'll be singing, This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day what the Lord has made. Amen. We will now have the reading of our Holy Scripture. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He should, he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of the waters that brings forth fruit of, in the season whose leaf shall not wither, and what, whatever he does shall prosper. But the ungodly is not so, for I like the shaft which, is it, which the wind drives away. Read you, first number of Psalm, may God bless the reading of his word. Amen, amen, amen. Thank God for another day. What a friend. We will now have our prayer. We have in Jesus all of our sins to bear. I will look unto the hills from which comes my help. All of my help comes from the Lord. Amazing grace. How sweet was that sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Father, we thank you for your grace. Most Holy Father, we thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for the productive meeting, Father, that the Good Shepherd had on yesterday. Father, we pray that you will sit our church high on a hill, Most Holy Father, on this corner. Not for our glory, Lord, but that your name your most holy name will be glorified in this congregation. Father, we are praying for the ones, Father, who, who experience a terrible destruction, storms, Father, tearing through their land on yesterday. We are praying for those, and Father, we are praying for the bereaved, most holy Father. And Lord, we come back to the Good Shepherd family. Father, we thank you for Mother Griffins, Father, the mother of this house. Thank you for her in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for each member one by one. Father, we thank you for the little children, most holy Father. But Jesus said, allow the children to come to him. Father, for they are the ones that will carry the name of a living God to a dying generation. So Father, we thank you for the little ones. Holy Father, we pray that you will forgive us for our sins, most Holy Father. Lord, those things that we have done contrary to your word, Father. And Lord, as we go forward, we promise to do the very best we can by the power of the Holy Spirit that you have invested in these, your people. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. Father, set us on a hill, Lord. Help us, Father. And just bless us, Father, from day to day. And Father, there'll become a time, Father. Lord, you promised us a brand new Jerusalem, most holy Father, that would descend on the earth, most holy Father. Lord, there will be a house with many mansions, most holy Father. And Lord, there will be trees on the banks of the rivers that will produce fruit for the healings of the nations. And most holy Father, your name will be written on our foreheads. 
and we will be with you forever and evermore. It is in the precious and majestic name of Jesus that your people do pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Amen, good shepherd. For the God we serve. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, deacons. Amen. Welcome. Amen. Good to see everybody today. Thank you. <laughs> um, we are celebrating. We're getting close to Christmas time where we celebrate the birth of the Lord, where the nation just does that. But we celebrate his birth every day. And so we're just grateful to be in the house of the Lord. Um, I'm going to lead us in, in prayer as we invoke the Holy Spirit, his presence here today. We thank him that he's already here, but he asked us to acknowledge him and to welcome him in, to have an attitude where we're saying we welcome you into the service and into our hearts. So let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is present with us today, and we ask your blessings on this service. We thank you for the word that's already gone forth in scripture and in song. We thank you for what you're about to do. We thank you for the preached word brought to us by Reverend Carlos. We ask you to bless this service today that we and anoint our ears so that we will truly hear what the Spirit is saying to us. And we thank you for all you being present, every part of you, Jehovah Rapha, God our healer, and Jehovah Jireh, God our provider, and Jehovah Nisse, God our peace. We thank you that whenever you are present, you bring all of your righteousness, all of your blessings, all of your mercy, all of your grace with you, and we receive it all, all that you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand for our um, response not response to scripture, our, our psalm of praise taken now from the 145th psalm, the 5th through the 8th verse and the 24th, 25th, 21st verse. Uh, if you read along, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. And we do not just want to say the words, but we want to be doers of the word. It says, I will meditate on your great goodness. And we want to think about the Lord and what he has done for us constantly. We remind ourselves that he's great. He's slow to anger. He's great in compassion. He's great in mercy. He says, my mouth shall speak a, a praise of the Lord and we will sing of his goodness. So right now worship with us as we listen to this uh, song brought to you by our praise team.
Amen. I love you, Jesus. Praise your name. Glory, glory. Amen. Amen. So now we are blessed to have one of our own. Again, God provides, right? We don't have to go out looking anywhere else. In our midst, we have very talented ministers. And so we're going to be blessed with a message from Reverend Carlos Davis, let's receive him as he comes. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Standing all across the room, message today will be coming from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Romans chapter 8 reads, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. 35 reads, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are part persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. 39 ends and reads that no power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I titled this and for, I see there's a few young people in the room and there's a new phrase that's out now is, who's going to check me? Who's going to check me, right? G-O-N, not G-O-I-N-G. -I, I was trying to be politically correct and put going, but it's really who going to check me, right? <laughs> who going to check me? So as it reads, uh, Brother Griffin, I was uh, listening to a song last week, and everybody's familiar. Patrice Russian had a song in the 80s, and she started to sing to her lover, and she was saying that he reminds her. She goes down in the song and starts to say all of the things that he reminded her of and all the sweet words and all the things that happened throughout the day that, that just reminded her of how good her relationship was with the one that she loved. Romans begins to give us that same act of love and power and understanding that just as Patrice Russian could go throughout the day and be reminded of the love and the constant action and deeds of the one she cared about, we can also sing the same song and be reminded of the love and action of Christ Jesus. I have three points for you today, and I promise I won't be before you long. And the points are simply as this, that we are to, for one, for those that want to write it down, that God reminds us of his love through his word. The second one is that he reminds us of it through his character and his actions. And the third one ending is that he reminds us through his son. God reminds us through his words by the understanding that we as Christians not only have the uh, absolute access and undisputed truth through salvation, but that we also are committed to the law that God asked for us to be committed to. That as the book and as the Romans was being uh, listed out, I was reading, and, and Romans really in this chapter was speaking to 
those in that time that were in fear of persecution. They weren't um, Christians as today we have a freedom, especially in the United States, to be um, free to believe and do as we choose. And in that time, there was a a period where not only were they being persecuted, but they were um, questioning at that point if it was worth it. If what they were doing, if what they were believing, if what it was that they were facing, they were facing calamities, they were facing destruction. And the question was posed to them that even if you get to the point of death, who can separate you from God even unto that point? It's not a a, a coincidence that now we have the uh, amazing ability to live a life and not face consequences um, as we think for trusting God. But the enemy has a very tricky way now that he is no longer using people uh, to slaughter us in the streets. He's no longer using people to to martyr us or make martyrs out of us. Now he's using not just uh, uh, the illusion of of troubles, but he's using even our own mind and our own uh, conscious being and using us to trick ourselves into believing that there is an absolute fight out there that we are involved in. The Bible reminds us that, yes, there is a war, yes, there is a fight, but Brother Taylor, he reminds us that it is not ours to fight. He tells us that you are absolutely true in believing that the enemy is just as real today as he was yesterday, that you still have persecution, that yes, you still have calamity, yes, you still have the enemy coming in and trying to divide your household and separate you in your marriage, and he's trying to tear your children away, but God reminds us that now it's not your fight. And so he's reminding us through his word that yes, there is a law, that we must address, right? There is a regulation for the common man. There is a situation that we must hold ourselves to be accountable for, but we must be reminded that the battle is not ours, but it is the Lord's. And so God, in reminding us through it, and if we go back to the beginning verses of that, that he reminds us through questions. And it's kind of ironic that God asks a question that he already knows the answer to. And yes, he was using his apostle to ask these questions, but these are poignant questions that I believe that God resonates in with us every day. We question ourselves as we go down on our knees to pray if the situation will truly be fixed. We stress out about children that we've already committed to the Lord. We stress out about a marriage that we've taken godly vows to. We stressed out about a job that he has already blessed us with. And so the questions are being asked only for us to not reconcile them to just be questions, but that they are answered through the significant prayers of the righteous. We know that the Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, what? Availeth much. And so our answers are given to us not through our problems, Our answers are not given to us through our daily walk, but they are given to us through prayer. So the first uh, verse of that, it begins to read, if we could put on screen, it says, so what shall we say about these wonderful things, things such as wonderful these that if God is for us, who can be against us? How wonderful is it to know that God has already set the standard? That God has already assured us in his word. Now this is before, and I, I... laughed because uh, Paul was, I thought, kind of rude uh, speaking to everybody. I don't know if you ever had a chance to really understand the characteristics of Paul, but this was a sarcastic response, a question that he was asking them because these were unruly people. These were people that were already committed to doubt. They were already committed to destruction of themselves, and we can be destructive of ourselves of, of believing that God can rescue us out of any situation. And so I can imagine that as he's speaking to them, he's snarkling and he's giggling and he's saying that these are such wonderful things as these that if God is for us, who can be against us? And I can imagine that as he's telling them this, they also have to remember that outside, some people are already slaughtered on the street. There's already blood and there's already bodies. There's already things that they had to face even before they came to church. So imagine us on this Sunday morning. Now, now these people are, are inside of a, 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 a situation inside of their, their temple, inside of a place to worship, inside of a place to praise, and on their way in, they had to step over bodies a lot of times. And so Paul, and, and, and be, 
being as sarcastic as he is, he asks a question that, that's, that's almost condescending. He calls it wonderful. Wonderful to know that while people are, are dying in the street, that if, that if God is for us, who can be against us? How, how wonderful is that to know that even in the most destructive situation in your life, that God is still in control? But the problem about that is, is that in our minds and in our hearts, we have the inability to trust. And when we get to a point of trusting God, then we start to question God about his own plan. And we begin to ask God to walk us through his plan as though we're going to see loopholes in it that would allow for us to not have to go to, through pain to get what we want from him. But what it tells us is that, that in this, that once this picture is painted, once it's being listed, once you see what he's already listed out, he spoke about calamity, Sister Brown. He talked about destruction. He talked about stress. He talked about anxiety. He lists these things, and then he even says that even unto death, right? But what I started to realize, Sister Thomas, that, that what it really is saying is that, therefore, God has given us power over things beyond our control. Conquer means that you've been able to master the problem. But he says that, that we are, what, more than conquerors through Christ. So, so now not only have we faced what we needed to control, but that he's given us power beyond those things. And that we've been, able, we've been able to master not only the task, but then the end result is that we've, we've been able to master the ability to trust. Because that is the ultimate goal of any Christian it's not the goal to change your problem it's to change your ability to trust God in your problem he never promised that the situation would change he never promised that that the headaches would go away he never but what he said is that if you give me those things then I will become the remedy for that not you yourself not the job that would give you the money, not the, not the house in the, in the neighborhood of your desire, not the car, not, not, not the friends, not the social status. But he says that I will take on the burden so that you can get the reward. Not the, not the reward outside of your problem. And that's what's so great about God, that, that he has the ability to reward you in the midst of trouble. That he can give you a, a, a remedy in the midst of your situation there's a question often asked that will God take you out of your problem I don't want God to just take me out of my problems I want him to teach me how to trust him in my problems I want God to teach me how to rely on him when all hell is breaking I don't need him to stop the enemy from coming at my door he promised that that the enemy won't be able to prevail he never said that he wouldn't come. He never said that you wouldn't have problems. He said that when they come against you, when your enemies come against you like a flood, what? That he would raise a standard. And so then we trust the fact that now we can depend on our victories through Christ. Not victories on ourselves, not victories on our own account, but that we depend on the victory through Christ. And that we wave our wife, white flag no longer to our problems as most people do. They surrender and they buckle down. But now as Christians, what's being asked of us through these questions, through these guarantees, is that now we wave our white flag to God. That we now surrender to him all of our problems and all of our doubt. And that it is. Allowing, allowing for us that in going into battle, Deacon Fraser and waving that white flag we are guaranteed a sure victory because now we are no longer bothered by the enemies before us because we understand who we stand behind that God has guaranteed us a sure victory with the right position and so again point one is that he does that in reminding us through his word through his word the observation of of earthly understandings and earthly situation induces spiritual growth and devotion. That simply means that all the hell that we're going through in life is to push us to a place of spiritual growth. Crying more than you find yourself needing to, it's because he's trying to grow you. 
stressed out sometime a bit more than, than, than you think you should be, pray about it. It's because he's trying to grow you. People that you thought you could depend on all of a sudden don't answer the phone, don't respond to text, don't check on you. Pray about it. Because he's trying to grow you. That we're getting to a point in God's word. He simply wants you to rely on his plan. And so point two goes through and says that through his character and his actions. God has a plan for forgiveness and an action that he puts to work through his love for us in the midst of our sin. The Bible says that, that while we were yet sinners, that what Christ died for us. And Christ came to seal the oath that no man could obligate himself to. And so if we look at the characters and the actions of God, we understand and we can thank God for the fact that God is not like us. God is not fickle. God doesn't waver. I used to have a, a, a neighbor, and I, I start find myself using that phrase all the time. When someone asks me how I'm doing, I say I'm fair to Midland. A lot of people don't know what that means anymore, but, but that means I'm, I'm neither here nor there. I got one foot in, one foot. That's not God. God is not a fair weather friend. God doesn't make his decisions based on how you treat him. And I think some of us really need to thank him for that. That God does not place you in situations based on your relationship with him. He places you in situations in a hopeful relationship that you will get to a better place with him. That God places you in moments not so that he can, can punish you. God, listen, I, God is not trying to punish you. There are consequences for what you do. Don't get me wrong. Every, every situation has a result. But God, his, his divine will is not to punish you. If that's the case, he would not have sent Christ. He could have done what he wanted to do at that point and, and mankind would have been damned. That, that was the original plan, but, but, but he decided that on your behalf, that, that, that in, 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 in all of who you are, the, the, the isms and the schisms, the good and the bad, the doubts, the fears, the angry moments, the situations where you have chosen your own path, even though he set one out for you, God has decided that I will give my son on your behalf. So that in those moments of doubt, in those moments of self-destruction, this is talking about, Romans is speaking about the, uh, uh, outside uh, 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 persecution and outside destruction. We don't live in that anymore, thank God. But the worst part about it is, is now we're self-destructive. We don't have to worry about somebody coming and killing us and hanging us for believing in Christ. We're doing it to ourselves. You do it every time you say that I'm a Christian and yet you doubt. And the problem is not that we doubt. The problem is that we remain there. That we have such a risen God and yet we live damned and persecuted and buried lives. So what do we say about these things? And I, I I'm, uh, was a bit perplexed because um, I found myself in the past three months, I think, in my own funk, right? And the, the one thing about me when, when I get to that point, I just like to work. I don't know how everybody else functions with stress and, and when home is not going right, Carlos just goes to work. I don't call in sick if I'm angry. I actually ask for overtime. That's me because I don't like dealing with my problems. And that's many of us. We don't really want to have those hard conversations. You don't really want to have those, 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 those real sensitive moments where you get to a point to where you not only have to be real with those around you, but now you really have to start being real with yourself. Because he was asking these questions to people that have never asked themselves that before. How many times have you looked at yourself and realized you were in a bad situation and said, but if God is for me, who can be against me? How many times have you said that? And then when you said it, how many times have you lived like you meant it? How many times have you loved somebody after they hurt you, knowing that if God is for me, who can be against me? How many times have you been angry and not knowing how to lay down the burden and not know how to forgive and not know how to rebuild a relationship and know how to push yourself to come to church, push yourself through prayer, push yourself through fast? How many times do you do that knowing that God is for me? 
Or do we do it hoping that at, at some point he'll come and just tap me out and tell me that, you know, I can sit on the bench for a while and he'll take the bat. That's not what it's about. What it's about is understanding that God knows us. Isaiah spoke about God's vengeance and control. On our behalf, checking those or who going to check me means that we don't, we no longer have to seek destruction because we're reminded through God's operative, operative understanding and love and kindness that the enemy already knows his place. The enemy already understands his position and he knows that his one goal is to keep you from restoring hope in the father's plan. And so the bad thing about it is, is that a Christian that doesn't understand their position in God doesn't have a dog in the fight because the enemy already knows who he is. That's a scary thing. Satan already knows who he is. He doesn't need a job description. He doesn't need a plan of action. He knows his course line of work. He understands from the beginning of time when he was kicked out of heaven that his number one goal was to destroy you. Not, 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 not only to, to, to get to a point in his, in, in, in his career where, where maybe he can get a promotion. His promotion is you. His goal is you. If you ever want to know the things that Satan thinks about and what his plan, his plan is you. And yet, we are so self-destructive that we're fighting the wrong enemy. You fight people in your household instead of praying. You bicker and argue amongst each other instead of worrying about who the real enemy is. We look in the mirror and pick at ourselves and go through self-destruction and talk about what isn't good about us, what should be better, what isn't working, what's not sounding right, how much weight we've gained, how much hair we what we don't have, what we do have. When there's an enemy in your midst that's waiting for you to close your eyes long enough for them to get you. And yet we're reminded in Romans that even through that, the only thing that he wants us to remember if we go through verse 33 is that God is still in control. And that who dares accuse us who God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with him. Right? 34 goes on and reads and we'll go to the, the next notation is that who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Pleading for us. I'm going to stop. Have you ever seen a, a, a lawyer in action? I mean a good lawyer. I think if you ask most black folk, the person, first name that pops in their head is, is Johnny Cochran, right? Most people are like, well, I've seen John." But a lawyer pleading. <laughs> I heard you take a chat. Pleading for us. Can you imagine Christ begging God to not give you what you deserve? That's what that means. It says that he sits in a place of honor, which means that, that God is not really honoring you. Okay, that, 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 that's what that means. If, if you read that and if you were to break it down, that Christ sits in the place of honor. We don't. That's why it's so important that when you get into this, this moment of warship and battle with the enemy, you need to know who you need to stand behind. We often feel so bold and we think too highly of ourselves and we think that we can go into this battle. No, it, it talks about not only putting on the whole armor of God, but do you know who the armor of God is and what the armor of God? It's Christ. It's Christ. That's why he died. But it says that he pleads for us. I'm so happy I have a God that pleads for me. I don't know, but I'm, I'm happy that I have a God that pleads for me. The pleading, I don't think we, we understand what an honor that is, that Christ is in heaven making intercession on your behalf. That while you're praying, he's up there saying, God, please let this work out for them. Please let this work out for them. That Christ is up there, when, when you're down here crying, he's saying, God, please, please see about them. Please heal their heart. Please touch them. Please bless their family. Please give them, give them relief. Please go see about them. That Christ is begging for you. That's amazing. 
amazing. That's why it was said in the beginning in verse 31 that these are wonderful things. It's a wonder to know that there's a majestic power that is pleading for your earthly good. That's wonderful to know that, 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 that it's so undeserving. It's so undeserving. Verse 35 goes on to, to say that after he pleads for us, it, it asks you the question again. We have to understand why these questions keep being asked. He asks it, and then he gives a response. He asks it, and then he nearly gives a rebuttal. And then he asks it, and then he gives a statement. And then 35, he asks again. He says, then after that, can anything ever separate you from God's love? Remember, 34 just said he's pleading for you. So then he wants to ask you, now after I told you that, after I just d gave a descriptive understanding to you that Christ himself is asking God to not give you what you deserve. Don't think of it as just what you're going through because what you're going through is really what you deserve. We ask God to take us out of a situation. Sometimes we have to understand that you deserve that situation. Want to find out why your friendships are wrong? Think about what kind of friends you are and see if you really deserve it. Think about the people that you've let in and see if you deserve it. We need to stop trying to figure God out. We need to start trying to figure ourselves out in God. Right? So he said that he pleads for us, and then he asked, then after I told you that, pretty much, you know, can anything then separate us? And does it mean that he no longer loves us, Deacon Chapman, if we have trouble or calamity? Or if we are persecuted, does it mean that he doesn't love us? If we've ever had a hungry moment in our lives, God forbid, does it mean that he didn't love you? If you're destitute, if you go home right now and you don't have any more money in the bank, or if you lose your assets, if the car goes away, if, you, if the repo man comes and visits you, if the light bill you can't pay, does that mean that God doesn't love you? Or in danger? Or if you're threatened even with death, does it mean that God doesn't know? I'll answer it, no. I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that God trusts you enough to trust him. That's what that means. That God trusts you enough to trust him. That when we get to a point in our lives where we finally want to throw in the towel, that's when God knows we'll really lean on him. That, that it, it, it's, it's not an, an day or, or, or an action that can go by that God doesn't already know you're going to face. Tell me one thing that we go through now that no one has ever gone through before. Tell me one thing. Nothing. Tell me one heartache that someone has felt that they can't look at the person next to them and ask them have they ever felt it. No. And so God understands mankind. God understands who we are. He understands what we can be subjected to. He understands our lack of understanding. He understands our inability to trust wholeheartedly. He understands our lack of perception. He understands our lack of self-care and self-worth and self-esteem. He understands it. And so the third point, you can go to verse 36. The third point says, or is, is that he does these things. Remember, he does it through his word. Then he does it through his character and his action, right? And then he does it through his son. So as the scripture says that for your sake we are killed every day and we are being slaughtered like sheep. Verse 37 goes on and says that no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through who? Christ who loved us. And so God does it, what, through his son. And this is how he does it through his son. And I think sometimes, and I use myself, I hate feeling like, I'm subjecting people to, to live the life that I've lived in my actions. I forget sometimes that God gave Christ to die for everything. And the reason why I say that is that because I begin to question God about the smallest things that are going wrong in my life. Like he didn't die for it. 
And I have to like hit myself sometimes. Like, like you know, that, that's, that's not what this life is about, right? It's not about the money. It's not about the cars. It's not about even all of us sitting here now because our lives are but a vapor. The Bible talks about that. And so we have to be reminded then how simplistic we really are as vessels, right? Is that, that man was created really for one task, and that was to what? To honor and worship God. That was it. We really were created for simple lives, right? And anybody who's spent even a day in Sunday school understands that Adam and Eve really just messed that up for everybody, right? And so then the complication of things came in, and so then that simple life that really was supposed to happen, then you have all these problems, right? Then you start understanding, and that goes back to saying it's a deserved life that we're living. We really deserve the life that we're living because the Bible says that we are born into sin and shaped into iniquity. So that the moment that you even are conceived into this world, sin is really already on you. The mindset to do wrong is already there. The ability to deceive and to lie and, and to, and to uh, backbite and, and to have angst and to all, the, it's already a part of you. But we have an overwhelming victory despite all these things through Christ who loved us. Now, I, again, when I question and I try, you know, everybody says you shouldn't question God. And if you tell me that you're in this room right now and you have never questioned God about what's going on in your life, you're not being honest. Because all of us, it's, it's human nature to question. And God, I believe, is not troubled by questions. He's troubled with the fact that you're asking things that he's already trying to reveal to you. And so we get to a point where we have to, if he's doing it through his son, well then how much does Christ love us? And that answers all questions. And I'll get to that. Verse 38 says that, and in speaking, that I am convinced that nothing can ever sin. Now, remember, he says that we have overwhelming victory through who? Christ, right? Who loved us. And then so he is convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Now, I can get into the full hermeneutics of it all, but that would be a bit complicated, right? But I just want to play with you guys for a minute if you can. Just entertain me, right? And so, Reverend Griffin, I saw this and realized that it was two different streams of love that were coming from one source. And so you have God's love, which is continuously mentioned, right? Where the power comes from. Right? But then in the prior text or prior verse, it says that we have the overwhelming victory through whose love? Christ. Right? So then why, why is it that we have to focus not only on God's love, but then focus on Christ's love? And if you believe in the, the Trinity and un, un, understand what we believe, that we understand that that comes from one stream. But there are two separate characteristics of love in this text. And so one is the love that comes through grace and mercy. The other is enough love to not give you what it would look like without grace and mercy. I'm going to explain that. So who can separate us from God's love? This wasn't speaking about before Christ. This was speaking about after Christ. Because it's Christ, through his redemptive power and what he's done, that has allowed for us to tap into this type of love that God is offering. That the only separation and the only uh, uh, thing that could separate us from God is the fact that Christ would have never died. That's the only thing that could ever separate you from God's love. Now, if it was based on Carlos, I'll be going to hell. 
If it was based on you, if it was based on Lisa, if it was based on Deborah, if it was based on anybody, then you would not get this type of love. Because this love comes through sacrifice. This love that God offers comes through the ability to have the blood of the lamb be the pleading sacrifice on your behalf. This love that is listed in this text only comes to those who believe in the full power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why he can say that neither death nor life because Christ conquered death and life. That's why he can say that neither angels nor demons because we are saved by one that's greater than both. That's why it says that neither our fears for today or tomorrow because on Calvary he paid the ultimate price for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's why it says that not even the powers of hell because the Bible says that he went to hell to conquer death. And so then we are, after all of that, we can see God what? We can see him through his word. We can see him through his character. And thank God that we can finally see him through his son. That we can be convinced that ultimately, even when all hell is breaking loose in my life, I still have Jesus. That it doesn't matter whatever may come. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a, an amazing thing to know that, yes, they are coming. Sister Brown, they are coming. Problems are coming. I'm convinced that when I leave here, I'm going to have a problem. I'm convinced that somebody is going to call me. I'm convinced that something may worry me tonight. But I'm even more convinced that after a while, everything will be all right. Because God has promised, you can go to 39, that he not only will raise a standard against us, and we can talk about the powers above and powers below, but then he says that indeed nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed through Christ Jesus. And so I'm almost done. And after all that, the revelation is in, in all of that, that God allowed for a destructive person to never face destruction. After he's shown you everything, after he's revealed himself in his word, after he's shown you who he is through his character and his actions, after he's given you his son and his son has paid a sacrifice for you, then he allows for destruction to never come to a destructive person. Wow. I talk to uh, my daughter sometimes and to entertain me if I'm telling her something that I think is amazing, she just says, wow, dad. But this really is a wow moment, Sister Jeter, because then think about how destructive you are. And think about how the love of God is constantly revealed through Christ to a destructive person. That God keeps you in a place and in a very uh, a narrow spot where you are able to feel life and still feel God sustaining you. That you can still feel pain and still have God that comes and sits by your side. That you can have a, a worry and doubt tonight, but that by time morning comes, that he restores you to the fullness of joy. That we are able through Christ to do this. And how do I know for a fact that he can do it? On a Friday. And I hate to be Baptist with y'all, but this is just what it is. That he decided on a Friday to let destruction come upon himself. He decided to take iniquity and take pain and take all that into him, his bosom. He decided that destruction would be on his shoulders. That as the cross began to fall, that they pushed somebody to his side to put the cross of destruction on my Messiah's shoulders. And then he decided to take the journey on my behalf up this hill and decided that in a destructive moment that, that as the earth began to destroy itself, the Bible says that it cracked open, that, that the sky turned black, that, that the moon began to drip red, and that, and that God went silent to mankind and, and all 
all day Friday he bled and all day Friday he thought about your anger and all day Friday and it, it went into night and by the time they pulled him down and put him in the ground he stayed there in the tomb all day he didn't get up he didn't cry about it he stayed dead and then not only did he stay dead but his spirit got up out of his body and went down and gained the keys to life and death and he decided that at that moment I'm going to work with a destructive person and he talked to God and He asked God, and God told him exactly where to go and all day Saturday and all night Saturday, but early Sunday morning. I, I believe that there's a God that revealed himself through Christ Jesus early morning. I believe that he got up. I'm not worried about what can destroy me. I'm not worried about what can hurt me. I'm not worried about anger. I'm not worried about anxiety. I'm worried about Christ. And the revelation of his love. Love pushed him to Calvary. Love made him die for me. Love made him go where nobody else could go on my behalf. Love made God cry out and the earth shut down on my behalf so that God can know the fullness of mankind's ability to trust. And so no, nothing can separate me. How can you separate me from a God that died on my behalf and then loved me even more to still get up? Can't separate me. You can't separate me from anything. So yeah, who is going to check me? No demon in hell can check me. No, 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 no enemy. Nothing can prevail because he said, I raise a standard against them that come against you. So God's love. God's love. And standing all across the room, I'm done. God's love. God's love is one worth experiencing. And I promise you, you'll think about it. I told you the young people use this now. But you'll think about it the next time you realize the enemy is coming in. You can just say, who's going to check me? He can't check you. He doesn't have the ability to check you. He doesn't have the ability to come in in and ask you about the troubles in your life because you're not even worried about the troubles in your life. He doesn't have the time to walk the floor with you and stress you out because you're not even worried about those things anymore that would stress you out. The mentality I've learned of the Christian is really important. It's important to know how to carry yourself when the enemy is at the dinner table. Because he's there for two meals and one of them is you. And so we have to understand that nobody, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. Because he did it through Christ for a reason. That is sealed. The Bible says that we are in his hand and no man, no man can pluck you out. No one. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to partake of your grace and your mercy. And more ultimately, Lord, we ask that you continue to allow for the love of your son to be revealed to us. We know you love us, God, because you gave us him. And we ask that that love and that action plan for our lives that you have in place for us, that we experience that, where we experience the fullness of who you are through your son, Jesus Christ. And all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for that word, that word. It's so good to know that we have overwhelming victory, overwhelming victory in Christ. That, that reminds me like of a baseball game where the score is 20 to nothing. It's an overwhelming victory. 
It's, it's when you see a, a race being run and the, and the lead runner is, is a mile ahead of everybody else. God gives us overwhelming victory. Not, he doesn't, it doesn't just squeak out. It's overwhelming victory in Christ Jesus. Thank you for that excellent word, Reverend Carlos. Um, after the prayer, what's next? Ah, we're going to welcome. Do we have anyone visiting with us today? Is there anyone? I don't think so. I seem to recognize all the faces here. And uh, nephew's back, Taylor nephew. So we'd like to, uh, we're always glad to see you. You're not a visitor anymore. Um, I do want to give the opportunity in case anyone does want to join the church. Well, no, I know you all. Okay. So if you, unless you want to rejoin. But we want to extend the invitation in case anyone out who's watching, you never know who might have come to Facebook and said, what's going on there? And heard the sermon and was inspired. And they say, you, I want that overwhelming victory. I want that overwhelming love. I want that Jesus who has given himself. And, that, and I, I don't want to be separated from the love of God. If that sermon might have touched you today and you just happened to click on Facebook, we are here at Good Shepherd. And we invite you to come and, and share. You can come down next Sunday. We're in the corner of 53rd and Figueroa in Los Angeles. And our doors are always open. And you're free to join with us and worship with us if you want to come worship in person. Um, we do have an offering, um, and we want to invite anyone, amen, for giving. <laughs> um, if we're going to have an opportunity to give today at the end of the service, if any of you want to give. But also, uh, you can give online anytime that you want. Uh, if you, you go to our Facebook page, the Good Shepherd NBCLA, Good Shepherd NBCLA, Missionary Baptist Church, NBCLA.com, and you can give at any time. There's a green button that says online giving if you want to share. If you want to just explore our webpage and look at what else is going on, uh, as the new year progresses, we'll be doing more. We want to wait until this latest surge of virus goes back down. We don't ever, and God's not in a hurry and we're not in a hurry. So we don't want to do anything foolish. But we do know that soon into the new year, at some point, we will be having more things going on here at the church. Um, so we'll go to our uh, announcements. Um, on, uh, we, do, we have a Wednesday night Bible study that's online right now. Um, at, it's on Facebook. If you want to go to Douglas Preston Griffin at 7 p.m., it's on at 7 p.m. Or at 8 p.m., it's on the Good Shepherd Facebook page, Good Shepherd MBCLA. So if you have Facebook, starting at 8 o'clock, you can look at the Bible study. Or if you want to go live, I'm, it's on at 7 p.m. It will eventually be back here at the church. But right now it's on, on Facebook. And the same thing with our... Um, Sunday school. Sunday school is at um, 10 a.m. and it's also on uh, Sunday mornings. I'm sorry, at 9 a.m. at Sunday mornings at Douglas Preston Griffin, or at by 11 Sunday school is. I'm sorry, by 10 a.m. it's on the Facebook page, Good Shepherd Baptist Church, or it's on our church website, Good Shepherd Baptist Church NBCLA Sunday school. This service is also being broadcast live but you can if you want to hear the sermon again and you might because it was good uh it's there anytime on our facebook page and also at our website so any sermon you want to rehear you don't have to worry about bringing a tape recorder with you they're all there on our facebook page or on our website either one at good shepherd baptist church nbc la so if there are uh, if there aren't any other announcements, I don't want to miss anything, if there's anything else. If not, uh, we'll, we can be dismissed. And uh, I, I should have turned on the heat earlier. Amen, I should have turned on the heat earlier. So it's my fault. Um, but next Sunday, the heat will be turned on earlier. So 
Everybody who, so it's like starting to heat up now, but we're leaving. <laughs> so it'll be turned on at the, uh, before you, an hour before you get here. So by the time you come in next Sunday, uh, it'll be warm in the church. So I appreciate your patience in that area. So please stand for our benediction if there's nothing else. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you again for that word. Help us to understand that nothing separates us from your love. There's no condition. There's nothing the devil can do. There's nothing the doctors can say. There's nothing the banker can say. There's no one that can separate us from your love. And we thank you for that. And the more we understand it, the more we can just worship and praise you despite the circumstances, despite what's going on. You don't remove the circumstances. You teach us how to praise you in the middle of it and to await your redemption. And so... We thank you for that word may be planted in our hearts. We ask you to bless us as we go from this place, as we're driving home. And whatever lives that we're about to enter, help us to spread your love to those people that we're about to encounter along the way and send your angels with us to protect us. Father, we give you praise for all things that you're about to do for us this week that we don't even know coming up, dangers seen and unseen. We thank you that you're always there for us. And now unto him who's able to keep us from falling to the only wise, true Savior, be all majesty, power, and glory forever in Jesus' name. Amen.